Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this, the second of our public sector webinars, looking at issues that have arisen since the coronavirus. Um, last week, we spent uh, some time looking at um, issues that had arisen um, landlord and tenant wise, specifically because of um, legislation that the government had introduced uh, to try to relieve some of the consequences of the economic downturn. Today, um, we're going to look slightly further ahead at some of the issues which may arise in public sector development agreements. So I'm joined by my partners, Mel Ray, John Bowman and Michelle Sheen. And together what we're going to do is um, look at development agreements in different scenarios. Um, John is a planning lawyer, and so um, he's going to touch on some of the planning issues that will be relevant to all of you. Michelle is a um, insolvency lawyer and um, busy at the moment, as you can imagine. So she's going to be speaking about some of the insolvency implications of COVID-19, particularly for those in, in the midst of development. And Merle's going to um, speak through the, the core, if you like, of um, uh, development agreement issues and how you might approach uh, certain stances in, in the agreement. Now, um, a bit of housekeeping. There will be, I hope, plenty of opportunity for questions at the end. Um, but do post your questions at any time you want to raise them. I will pick them up and each of the panellists um, will do their best to come back to you with an answer. Um, there will be a short survey at the end of this um, webinar. I said that last week and it, it took a couple of days to pop up. But today I'm promised that it will be there with you. And um, also, as I mentioned on the webinar last week, there is a free Phil Fisher helpline for the public sector. And we are delighted to have an opportunity to help you with your issue. So do, do feel free to make use of that. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Mel Ray, who's going to set the scene for us um, as we look at a, a typical development agreement. OK, so our title for this um, seminar is Navigating Obstacles in the Road for Development Agreements. Um, there will be a lot of people out there with development agreements and they will all vary. But what we wanted to do in the first slide, so Chloe, bring us on the first slide, is to talk to the, the general classic development agreement scenario. So normally what we'll see there's a development agreement for a mixed scheme so it could be a mix of residential um, retail offices it could involve um, uh, buildings being constructed for the council itself uh, or maybe not so there's usually an element of council land they're very classically a car park and that's why the council's involved um, the scenario I'm going to look at today is where the land is transferred once the scheme is completed or partly completed and that will bring us on to look at some of the default obligations later. Um, we look at two scenarios here. One is you have a development agreement, so it's the council, the developer and it may be a guarantor. The work has not yet started but there are concerns regarding viability. Most development agreements have a precondition period and we'll look at what the council can do in that situation. And the next scenario is where the work has started and the developer has ceased work on site or has become insolvent. So in these two scenarios, what might the council do? And that takes us to the next slide. Chloe, next slide. Thank you. Sorry, there's going to be a pause for the slides. Um, now, the scenario where the preconditions are not met, so you've got a development agreement, it's conditional, very likely upon planning, site assembly, there being pre-lets, the scheme itself being viable, and it also may be conditional upon the developer getting funding to build out the scheme. Now, those preconditions will be subject to a long stop date by which if the planning, if the conditions, the preconditions, I should say, are not met, then the agreement itself can be brought to an end, usually by either party. So 
what are your options, councils, if preconditions cannot be met or cannot be met in time? There's obviously all sorts of difficulties at the moment with, with planning, people getting on site, all sorts of things that have been effectively put into abeyance. Well, your options are three. The first is to vary the development agreement, and I'll talk about that in the next slide. The second is to terminate the development agreement. That is where you've met the long stop date and the preconditions have not been met. And the third one is wait and see. And I'm quite a fan of wait and see, because at the moment, we honestly do not know what is going to be happening. So if somebody can tell me later, maybe um, we'll know what will happen. But I think at the moment, none of us know where we are. So wait and see is a good option. Right, next slide, please, Chloe. Now, if you want to vary your development agreement, there are probably three things that you might want to do. The first thing is to vary the long stop date by which the preconditions have to be met. So give the developer more time to meet its preconditions, its planning, its site assembly. Um, in, in current COVID-19 environment, that is probably going to be look like nine months or a year. As I say, who knows, but you might want to vary the long stop date, give everybody more time. The second thing you might want to do is reframe the obligations. You may find that the scheme proposed has maybe a lot of um, retail, maybe it has a hotel and hotels aren't going to be taking pre-lets in the foreseeable future, I don't think. So you might want to reframe the obligations about what happens once the preconditions are met and also what the preconditions need to be for planning permission for and then say what that is. You also might want to extend the time frame for the development works to be undertaken and completed once the preconditions are met. Now, there are two things to consider here. The first thing, a, a bit of a techie point, it's section two of the Law of Property Miscellaneous Provisions Act 1989. I was sadly around when this uh, legislation came into force, so I do remember it, but what's really important is if you vary a contract for the sale of land, you must always make sure that you incorporate all the provisions of the agreement that you're varying into one document. Um, I've seen a document just last three weeks where that wasn't done. What it, what it, if you don't do that, what happens is the original contract for the sale of land is void, so it's a technical point, but it's really important. And the second thing for councils is to consider the procurement rules and how much, if you start varying your development agreement, you have strayed outside of the original parameters of the procurement. Um, so I know that we are leaving Europe, but we're still at the moment subject to those procurement rules. So you will need to have your procurement officer look over those. Next slide, please, Clay. Now, if your preconditions are not met, the other two things you can do is you can terminate your development agreement if you've reached your long stop date. And we deal later on with some consequences of termination. It's not always the panacea you might hope. Um, and the second one, which the third one, sorry, which I've said is one of my favorites is wait and see. Now, if you are going to wait and see what happens and not take any, any actions, what you have to do is you have to be very active in your wait and see. So first of all, you've got to ensure you've got good communication lines with the developer. You understand what the developer is likely to be doing in the next few months or not doing. Um, you have a watching brief on the obligations of the council and also the developer. And you need to be very aware of any long stop dates or dates that may be breached or um, waiving the obligations of the developer. So I think, I think wait and see is a good option, but you really do need to look at all your timings and then work out what's best for your development agreement going forward. So next slide, please. Now, the next scenario is one that you may find yourself in at the moment. This is a scenario where preconditions have been met and works have started on site, but they're not progressing as planned. Now, Cecily is going to talk a little bit about construction obligations, and we know the government have been, I'm, I've not 
had not been quick to close down construction sites. So works are still progressing in some places. Um, other places, the works will have stopped. Now, what are your obligation what are your options here the first thing you can do is you can look to activate the event of default provisions in the development agreement itself um, the second thing you might do is to renegotiate the development agreement to allow more time for works to be undertaken and perhaps even to vary some of those works especially where you've got phased schemes and the third thing you can do is to wait and see and if you wait and see I've said see above be active in your waiting and seeing knowing what's going on knowing what the developers plans are and and checking the the situation regarding the pandemic as well so now, that's can active I waiting for a second um I've, I'm getting messages that some attendees are not hearing you very well um and there's a suggestion um that you might switch off your video and just do audio um I, I can hear you perfectly well i must confess but a few of the um participants are emailing to say that the sound isn't great um, okay I, i'll turn off the video let me um let me know um if people want to go back at all okay some are now saying I can hear fine, so um, yeah, I can hear. Let's, let's give that a go. Okay, right. Thanks, so, Mark. does anybody want us to go back? Um, if if people could just um, for a second email it me and say that, yeah, people are now saying they can hear fine. So let's okay. crack on. No, I don't think we need to go back. Let's let's just let's carry on. OK, so we're on the slide. We're looking at the scenario where the preconditions to the development agreement have been met. The works have started, but they're not progressing as planned. What's the council's option here? The first one is the council can look to activate the event, the event of default provisions within the development agreement. There's normally an obligation to commence works and continue them diligently. Um, the second thing the council might want to do is to renegotiate the development agreement obligation extending time periods, perhaps replanning what sort of works will be undertaken by the developer. And the third thing is the wait and see option. And as I mentioned above, if you are going to wait and see what happens, you need to be actively monitoring, recording and having a really good understanding of what the developer is proposing and what might be um, possible going forward. So it's active waiting and seeing. Um, next slide, please, Clay. Now, taking the first of those options, works have stopped. Um, you're not happy with how things are progressing. You think actually this development might not be a um, be one that is ever going to be achieved. So, the typical default clause within the development agreement will look something like this. So it will be an event of default if the developer materially breaches one of its obligations. It'll be an event of default if the developer becomes insolvent. It will, all steps are taken towards insolvency very often. It will be an event of default if the developer does not start work on the agreed start date or diligently proceed with works thereafter. And it will, will also be an event of default if the developer does not complete works on the agreed completion date. Um, now, that's usually pushed out by the relevant events under the building contract, which Cecily will talk about later. If there is a guarantor, then if the guarantor breaches any of its obligations, for example, if it becomes insolvent, then it that will also be an event of default under the development agreement. So if you believe there's an event, event of default, what can you do? Now, the next slide. The typical remedy for the council is the council will serve notice on the developer of the breach. If the breach is capable of remedy, the developer will be allowed a reasonable period of time within which to remediate the breach, start the works if it hasn't started them, um, to diligently proceed with the works if it has stopped. 
that uh, that reasonable period of time is often limited to a couple of months, but I think you would need to look at that again in the corona um, virus environment. Um, and finally, if the um, if the breach is not capable of remedy, i.e., the, the developers can become insolvent, it can't suddenly become uninsolvent, or it's been given some time to remedy the breach and it has not remedied the breach, then you can usually serve notice to terminate the development agreement. Now, if you do that, there will almost inevitably be some thunder rights to step into the agreement. And that's our next slide. Slide, please, Chloe. Thank you. So the approved funder has usually lent money to the developer to buy land at the site, or it's lent money to enable the developer to undertake the works. Now, the approved funder may wish to rescue the scheme and recover its lending. Now, the, the typical um, default clause says the council cannot terminate the development agreement unless it gives the approved funder notice that it's going to terminate and allow the approved fund the opportunity to step into the scheme or nominate a suitable alternative developer to do so. That is normally a period of months to allow that to happen. But again, you might want to consider whether a longer period of time is allowed in the current environment. If the approved funder doesn't act swiftly and, and take notice, um, of the notice served on it by the council, then the council's right to terminate the development agreement normally arises. So that's great. Let's go on to the next slide. We think perhaps we can terminate um, the development agreement. What are usually the consequences of termination in the agreement? Well, the council can take possession of the site, consider whether or not you'd want to do that. The council can often step into the construction contracts, the architect's appointments, those sorts of things. So it has step in rights. The council will often have an option to acquire third party interests that the developer has acquired within the site. And also to pick up agreements for lease, maybe with some of the pre-lets. So to take control of everything the developer previously had control of. And usually you will find the council has the benefit of a royalty free license for the use of drawings and for intellectual property to complete the scheme if it does step in. Now, the next slide deals with some practical considerations when terminating a development agreement. And I think that Cecily is going to pick up this slide. I am. Thanks very much indeed, Mel. Um, so this all uh, is Armageddon, if you like. You're in a situation where um, you as a council um, are being are you know giving serious consideration as to whether or not you should go forward with stepping in and taking control. Um, having responsibility for a site um, is no mean feat, uh, particularly if actually this is not your day job and it's not something that you are typically accustomed to doing. So um, there will be obligations with regard to health and safety and insurance um, and frankly it's something that i i think most local authorities are keen to um, avoid um there will be obligations with regard to the um equipment that's been left on site by the um by the contractor and for all those involved um in the scheme and remember and i'm sure that michelle will talk about this when we come on that um e equipment is going to be there that doesn't necessarily belong to the contractor that's been hired by them um that it that isn't really um it up for grabs if you like but you need in order to be able to continue works some contracts will make provision um for what should happen to materials or plant in that in that scenario but not all do now finishing a project when it's half started is something that um, people are are not keen to progress, um, typically um, because the cost of going halfway to the end isn't always going to be um, 
half the cost of the budget. Quite often, um, it is more expensive to conclude a project that has been started. And there are al almost certainly going to be complexities around um, the integration of works and warranties that have been given for, for works. Um, so as you can see, this isn't something um, that is for the faint hearted. There will be payments that the contractor and subcontractors have not yet received. And as part of the consideration of step in, um, there will be uh, an obligation typically in those direct agreements to um, uh, give effect to payments that are due to be made. The contractor is going to have stood still for a period whilst there's a consideration about step in um, and uh, it, it won't continue at risk. It's going to want to be made whole and to have some certainty about payments that have been uh, proposed for the future. So the capacity of the council to assume the role, role of developer, I mean, I think the preceding points um, really touch on that very well. Is the council in a position where it can, um, as hitherto a sort of interested party, now take the reins of this project? Do you have, um, you know, capacity within the organisation uh, to take on the responsibilities that a developer would have? Are you best cutting your losses and trying to move forward? So um, there are reputational um, issues associated with this. Um, and I think uh, that in my experience, it is very unusual for councils to step on to um, taking this responsibility. But I think in the context of where we are presently, it would not surprise me um, if more uh, councils faced with um, a large scale default across different projects took the view that it needed to um, be controlling um, a situation rather than letting it unfold in front of it. So um, much as lawyers spend a great deal of time looking at the consequences of termination and um, following step, step in, it is an unusual thing to happen but query whether it will happen a bit more frequently in the circumstances we're looking at now. Uh, Chloe, next slide, if I may. So um, Mel talks about relevant events, and um, I want to say a little bit about these two words, force majeure, which I'm sure many of you have heard more of in the last couple of months. Um, than most people have heard of in a lifetime. Um, if I step back to um, the early days of the coronavirus, before it had really um, grasped the UK in the way in which it has now, um, we were beginning to be asked questions about whether contractors had the opportunity um, to get relief for delay. Um, and, you know, I'm a generally an employer's lawyer rather than a contractor's lawyer. And I, I won't um, hide the fact that I think most employers' lawyers at the beginning were quite poo-pooing of the suggestion that this event um, some way across the world, which was not really um, doing much in the UK, was going to lead to a, a, a relief event under their construction contract. And so we were looking um, at circumstances in contracts which would allow there to be relief for missed completion dates. Now, very typically, the um, building contract that is used in the context of public sector contracts is, of course, the JCT um, or the NEC contract. And I'll speak about the contrast between them a little later on. But the key provisions that we were looking at under the JCT um, to deal with uh, whether there could be an adjustment to time um, would be in relation to clauses 223 through to 226. And then, of course, there's an opportunity um, for loss and expense under clauses 419 to 4 to 421. Um, the contractor is entitled to an extension of time if there has been a relevant event. And I say if there has been a relevant event. Um, 
putting great emphasis on the if, the most likely um, provisions uh, under the JCT um, are two. The first is where a government or any other um, statutory body um, has exercised after the base date, and that's the date basically where time stands still, um, they exercise a new statutory power. Um, and if they do that in circumstances which have not been derived through contractor default, the contractor is entitled to more time. Now, what we know and what um, Merle has spoken about is that the government has been quite reluctant to announce the closure of construction sites. In fact, quite the contrary, um, in the Houses of uh, in the House of Commons, um, the Secretary of State um, for uh, Business and Enterprise said very categorically that construction would remain open for business. Um, contrary to shops and hotels, there is no government edict that construction sites should be closed. So there isn't an opportunity under 226.12, which is, I think, where most of us thought that um, the relief event or the relevant event would arise. Where we are seeing, um, I think, um, more likelihood of um, relief is through the force majeure provision. Now, importantly, force majeure is not a doctrine under English law. It is something that is what we call a creature of contract. So if your contract has no force majeure provision in it, and typically I think leases, as we discussed last week, and agreement for leases um, and development agreements, in fact, won't necessarily have force majeure provisions in, um, but building contracts most certainly will. It would be unusual for there to be no force majeure provision. Although, um, interestingly, the JCT does not define the term. So um, it, it, it's important to, to realise also that the fact that this event, and it's typically um, when it is defined, it's defined as something which is an act of God. It's beyond the control or contemplation of the parties. Um, it might be war, hostility. Um, it might be biological uh, contamination. Um, the word endemic or pandemic is used in some provisions, but not all. But I have to say, um, I think it would be quite difficult uh, to argue presently as an employer um, that the circumstances we're facing did not amount to a force majeure event. The issue, however, is whether the event is causative of the delay. So it's all well and good that there's a pan pandemic, um, but is it the cause of the delay that the contractor is experiencing? You know, we had an example where actually the contractor um, was not showing any very significant um, fall in the number of workers who were attending at site. Um, it wasn't particularly having difficulty getting hold of materials and so on. So the fact that there is pandemonium and chaos going around doesn't automatically mean that the contractor gets a relief event. Most importantly, under the JCT provisions, and people often forget this, there is an obligation on the contractor at clause 225.6 to use its best endeavours to prevent delay. So it's a mitigation um, obligation. So the contractor has to take steps which um, he would ordinarily and prudently do for himself. And that's sort of generally where we take the test of what does best endeavours mean. Um, so, you know, there is an obligation, as I say, to mitigate the delay. Um, and that's often forgotten. It's not just that there must be uh, an event, the event must be causative of delay and the contractor must have done his best to stop it. Now, the thing that uh, I think is particularly interesting um, is that the NEC contract, which is often sort of spoken of as the great public sector contract, is much more generous to contractors in this context um, the, the JCT provisions. So in the first instance, there is no obligation on the contractor to mitigate loss. And in the second, 
loss and expense, which you don't get under the JCT for a force measure event, you will get under the NEC. So uh, I have been um, uh, for a number of years questioning quite why the public sector is so infused by the NEC. And I think this is a, a sort of very um, strange example, if you like, of where actually the public sector is not served by the, the um, language that's in the NEC contracts. So that's all I want to say for the time being about construction issues. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Michelle Sheen, um, who's going to say a word about insolvency. Thanks, Cecily. Uh, good morning. So we've been looking so far at what remedies and courses of actions are available to a contracting party, um, you, the council, when the other contracting party, a developer, can't fulfil its side of the contract. There are some practical and legal consequences of the developer going into an administration or liquidation process, which may curtail these courses of action. So what I'm going to do is concentrate more on administration, as this is the most prohibitive of the insolvency processes. So as you can imagine, <clears throat> this is a huge and very complex topic. So today I'm just going to briefly mention some of these consequences and also touch on a couple of the proposed changes to the insolvency law, which may be brought into force in the next month or so, dealing specifically with the COVID crisis. So the first problem that a party contracting with an insolvent party will face is if the company goes into administration, this will automatically create a statutory moratorium. So anyone dealing with the company can't enforce any security or take any legal action against the company without the consent of the administrator or court. Therefore, any provisions of any contract with the insolvent company, which needs to be enforced through the court, will need consent, and this may not be forthcoming. The second problem relates to transactions at an undervalue. So a transaction at an undervalue is a transaction where the benefit obtained by the other contracting party outweighs the benefit of the to the insolvent company so for example an option to take any interest owned by the insolvent developer uh, for a nominal value a contractual obligation to take possession of the site for a nominal value or for no value an option to take a transfer of land or assets for a nominal or no consideration on the happening of certain events a transaction of earned value can be challenged if it's entered into in the two years preceding the administration or liquidation of the insolvent company. And this is particularly draconian because on the application to court by an administrator or liquidator, the court can make any order that it thinks fit, including reversing the transaction. So those that you may be relying on to take control of some portion of the company's property may be voidable. The third problem relates to the anti-deprivation principle. So a contract will be void, and note that that will be void, it's not an option, but anti-deprivation if it enables the party to that contract on the insolvency of the other party to obtain an additional advantage which prevents the property of the insolvent company being distributed in accordance with insolvency legislation. So, for example, if you have a contract which gives a royalty-free license to drawings or intellectual property, which comes into the effect specifically on the insolvency of the company who has ownership of the intellectual property or the drawings, an administrator may refute the license and ask the payment to be made. Similar to the last part, if there is a transfer of valuable rights on insolvency, this can also be overturned by an administrator. So the fourth problem that I want to touch on relates to stepping rights. So many of the stepping rights which I deal with are rights which are used in conjunction with the exercise of the security interest. So despite the statutory moratorium, a secured creditor's rights are usually seen as preeminent on an insolvency. But aside from security, a mere contractual stepping right, which is not security-based, will be harder to enforce on an administration as it's open to the administrator to refuse to allow the step-in. So the council would then have to take proceedings to enforce the step-in 
which of course can't be commenced without the consent of the administrator or court. There's also the problem of using third party equipment, which will need the consent of the relevant third party owner, and also a problem potentially with access to leasehold property, as this will be subject to landlord's consent. So whilst we might see stepping rights as being very valuable, they will actually be subject to third party rights. So I'll just touch very briefly on two of the main changes to the insolvency legislation being contemplated due to the COVID crisis. The first is the introduction of a short business rescue moratorium of 28 days, which can be extended with credit to consent. This can only be applied for by a company which is not actually insolvent, but which may become insolvent in the future. This moratorium will have the same effect as the administration moratorium, which I mentioned earlier, in that no enforcement actions or proceedings can be commenced or continued with without the consent of the court. The second uh, modification to the insolvency legislation is the suspension of what we would call an ipso facto clause. So this is a clause that allows a contractor to terminate a contract purely on the basis of insolvency. This prevents the contractors from being able to rely on this clause, which means that the contract can't be terminated purely on the basis of insolvency. This will have wide ranging implications where a contracting party has remedies and courses of action available on termination, as obviously termination won't be able to be affected if the termination is based purely on the relevant party entering into an insolvency process. So that's all I've got to say on this. As I said, it's a, a very complex and wide ranging topic. If anyone's got any questions, please feel free to ask. But in the meantime, I will hand over to John. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit now about the impact of the current uh, COVID restrictions on the planning system. Uh, and how it may impact on current developments and development agreements. Uh, we're already seeing that these restrictions are having a, a major impact on all stages in the planning process, um, from the making of planning applications and then them being processed by the planning authority. Uh, it's having an impact on uh, how long it's taking to negotiate Section 106 planning agreements and Section 278 highway agreements. Uh, it's going to have an impact on planning appeals um, where um, a hearing or an inquiry is needed. It's having an impact on judicial challenges uh, to uh, planning decisions as well. It's having an impact in practical terms on discharging planning conditions um, and an impact on uh, commencing development on time. So there's, there's hours of issues that could be discussed, but I just want to touch on four main areas uh, in the next few minutes, uh, being the discharge of planning conditions, uh, what happens when a planning permission is about to expire, uh, some issues around Section 106 obligations, and uh, if the community infrastructure levy uh, applies to a particular development, what impact that might have uh, during this uh, lockdown period. So if we go to the next slide, please, Chloe. Um, we're already seeing some practical difficulties uh, in getting planning conditions discharged. I mean, not least because planning authorities are stretched um, and not all um, fully equipped to be working remotely. Um, so that in itself is um, quite a big issue. And then there are practical issues. Uh, and broadly, they split into some conditions which require a, an element of attendance at the site to monitor progress and then um, those conditions where surveys are to be carried out but those surveys depend on assessing normal background levels so i've just given a few examples on this slide um, of uh, both of those categories so quite often archaeology conditions are imposed uh, that require um, ongoing um, records to be taken as the development progresses uh, and sometimes before development even commences and you know you, you are likely to need an expert uh, consultant on hand on behalf of the developer and quite often uh, a council officer such as a county archaeologist will need to attend from time to time 
um, if the site has contamination issues, um, they also have to be um, uh, monitored and you would need um, experts there, environmental consultants to uh, assess uh, what was being found. And again, you may need council officers either to attend or to be able to review what the expert finds. Uh, and then you often have wildlife conditions depending where the site is. So you might need to do a newt monitoring survey, for example. Uh, and again, you need experts on site to do that. And the thought's going to be need to be given to that um, when all but essential travel is being discouraged by government. Uh, I think there's ways around it by arguing that this is work that can't be carried out other than at the site. But um, again, there's like to be some reluctance uh, uh, on the part of some of the participants. Um, and I've then put traffic and air quality as two good examples of surveys that are often carried out um, and which really don't work at the moment because clearly um, air quality and background air quality is um, being improved uh, by the much reduced uh, use of vehicles and trains and airplanes. Um, and the same goes for traffic surveys. Um, traffic is much reduced. so working out uh, the impact of a new development on existing traffic doesn't really work at the moment. And I know of a number of planning authorities that are saying to developers, um, we can't accept surveys around these uh, types of topics at the moment. Uh, you're gonna have to wait until the lockdown period is, is finished and uh, traffic and air quality would turn to more normal levels. So that, that feeds actually into my next slide because clearly that can uh, occasion delay in the process. Um, and we saw this um, in the last recession in 2008, 2009. Um, what happens if your planning permission is about to expire? Um, this could be uh, quite problematic. If you've still got pre-commencement conditions to discharge, such as the ones I've just been talking about, I think it could be really tough to start development uh, depending when your expiry date is. Um, but this this should be a, a big issue on the government's radar because uh, the risk is that otherwise valuable projects are, are going to fail to be able to proceed because a planning permission expires. Um, and the obvious example is um, housing supply. So if if there's a good housing development but the permission expires, uh, housing supply that a local authority has been counting on. Uh, is gone or is gone until the permission is uh, reapplied for. So um, even if pre-commencement conditions have been discharged, there may still be practical issues about getting a contractor on site to carry out enough work to actually uh, make sure the permission has been implemented before it expires. Uh, and I've been hearing examples of the contractors who've already been engaged for a particular development actually not being available uh, to go on site. So you may have a situation where developers have to go off and find a different contractor solely to go on to site and dig some trenches or foundation works to preserve a permission. So uh, what solutions are there? Well, uh, when the Scottish coronavirus bill went through the Scottish Parliament, uh, they, they did manage to find space in the drafting to provide that if a planning permission was to expire within six months of the date of that um, act coming into force, um, the permission would automatically be extended uh, for 12 months from the date of that act. Um, now that's not in, that doesn't appear in the Coronavirus Act that applies to England. Um, and there may not be enough parliamentary time uh, to bring that solution in, although that's clearly quite a tidy solution. Um, so there may need to be um, a different fix. And it may be that the government gives guidance to local planning authorities to say, actually, if you vary the condition to allow a short additional period before the permission expires, uh, you should regard that as a non-material amendment under the Planning Act. Uh, I think it's pretty doubtful it's actually a non-material amendment, but if the government uh, gives some guidance, um, that may make it less likely to be challenged. Another route might be to introduce a temporary permitted development right, again, providing for um, a short extension to those permissions expiring, say, within six months of um, the uh, government restrictions coming into place. Um, and if that doesn't work, then we would go back to what happened in the last recession, um, where 
the government introduced a streamlined system to provide for replacement planning permissions to be a granted consent you know reasonably straightforwardly um, where the permission had actually expired so if we go to the next slide please chloe um, a couple of comments now on viability issues you may have a situation where section 106 has been entered into and it contains the usual types of obligations. So there may be a requirement to provide affordable housing according to particular dates or schedules and likewise financial contributions. So um, if that uh, Section 106 has been uh, triggered and it may be uh, that development has commenced and therefore uh, those issues are alive, um, in, in the new uh, market that we find ourselves in, those obligations might actually mean the development is no longer viable. So um, what scope is there to relax or reschedule obligations in the Section 106? Uh, it is open to the landowner and the planning authority to agree to vary an existing Section 106 agreement. Um, but um, historically, I, I've found that there's a reluctance to do that very soon after uh, the 106 has actually been entered into but i know the government's being lobbied pretty hard on this point to encourage planning authorities to try and be flexible where they can uh, as part of saving uh, developments worthwhile developments that might otherwise fail because of the 106 obligations um, going back to um, 2008 2009 um, there were temporary provisions that allowed section 106 is to be amended uh, to renegotiate affordable housing provision based on the viability that uh, then prevailed. Um, so that would be one possibility. And I know the government is being asked uh, by various bodies to think about widening that so it would pick up other Section 106 commitments that could go to viability. Uh, and then finally, if we could go on to the next slide, Chloe, uh, and it's a similar point around the community infrastructure levy. Um, and that obviously doesn't apply to all developments but only in those uh, jurisdictions where it's been introduced um, it's usually uh, payable after development commences so if you haven't commenced development uh, you could uh, not commence development and not trigger the sill payments but if your permission is about to expire you may have to commence development uh, and then uh, there's very little flexibility once development's been commenced to reassess uh, readdress, reassess SIL. So, um, uh, e and sometimes the payments are phased, so uh, there may still be some payments over the next number of months, which could hit at a time when the development's actually stopped. And uh, so the revenue that the development will eventually uh, produce is going to be delayed as well. Um, there is some provision in exceptional circumstances. Um, and again, I know the government's being lobbied hard to say that the current COVID restrictions are indeed exceptional circumstances. Um, but you know, if, if that's to happen, I imagine it's not going to be for um, very long periods. So it might be just restricted to the period that the lockdown is in place or for the period that works have had to stop on site. Um, or I suppose the government might uh, look at the Scottish example and say, well, actually, 12 months from when we brought in the COVID, so the, sorry, the Coronavirus Act, 12-month uh, period might might be a sensible period. So those are just a few observations on, on the many issues I think that uh, the planning system is going to have for uh, current developments and development agreements. Uh, we're expecting more guidance and regulation from the government, but they've clearly got a lot on their plate so uh, planning is only just one of a number of matters that um, is going to occupy um, government and parliamentary time uh, and with that I'll, I'll hand back to Cecily. John thank you and um, it, it seems to me the, the word that um, is being um, used a lot in my discussions with authorities pragmatism so um, I'm sure you share that. I, yes. I, I want to encourage um, some more questions we have had some that I'm sure there are many more out there so do please um send questions through and um i will kick off with some that we've received um and these john um are in the first instance for, for you i think 
Okay. So the first question is, is whether you think um, there's likely to be a, a continuation of the function of um, the planning process at the moment and, and whether it will be compliant with statutory timeframes during the, the pandemic. Or do you think that a bit like what we're seeing in the courts that actually um, it, it's going to begin to sort of the wheels will come off a bit a bit more? Uh, I think that's entirely possible. Um, as I say, um, there's the sort of basic resourcing issue um, that, that understandably local authorities are facing. Uh, not all local authorities are geared up to work 100% remotely. Um, and the sort of basic consultation requirements that you have uh, during a planning application process um, are going to need to be looked at quite carefully so that um, all participants feel that they are still able to be part of that process. Um, I think there's also going to be issues around um, planning appeals and uh, planning hearings um, because uh, I know that the planning inspectors are still grappling with how um, in practice they're going to be able to proceed with public inquiries because clearly social distancing and public inquiries or uh, public hearings uh, don't exist very well together. Uh, so how much of that could be done uh, by way of remote uh, inquiries or hearings and I suspect they'll be they'll be looking with interest at what the courts are doing or planning to do. Um, but uh, I think it, the fact, for example, that there's not a clear route to appeal at the moment may also discourage developers um, who are waiting uh, beyond the statutory period for their planning application to be decided. Because one of the options is for them to say, uh, you haven't determined this, we're going to appeal against your non-determination. Uh, but if if you're if the result of that is that you then go into a very long period of uncertainty because uh, inquiries are either not happening or happening in a different way and probably more slowly, uh, it might actually encourage you to keep the dialogue going with the planning authority in the hope you can get permission granted by them eventually. Uh, so uh, I suppose the the short answer is yes. I think everything's going to take longer um, and. So and take different routes probably. Thanks, John. Um, Merle, I think I think this one is is probably for you, and it's about um, the frequency with which you see development agreements being varied before preconditions are satisfied. Um, and then there's a separate but related question, um, which is around. Um, the likelihood of councils stepping into development agreements and what tips you would give um, them in circumstances where they were thinking that um, down the line they were intending to do so. Okay, well, taking the first of those, how often do we see development agreements being varied in the precondition um, phase? I think we see that quite a lot. But often the preconditions to a development agreement have three years, maybe with extensions for planning. And um, as we've, we all know, there have been quite a few ups and downs in the economy um, recently, and therefore quite often they do get varied to allow for further time. Um, so I think that's that's pretty common occurrence there. In terms of whether or not council should step into development agreements, I, or, or step into the developer's obligations within agreements. I think that's a pretty rare thing to do. And you would probably find councils only doing that towards the end of a development's life. As you said, Cecily, it's very, very difficult for a council to step in um, to a scheme that's midway through. Contractors, new contractors don't want to pick up old contractors' works. Existing contractors often want to be paid for things or have issues that have been brewing that make it very difficult um, for people to step in. But if a scheme is close to the end of, of its life, um, in terms of it's almost not the end of its life, it is almost ready and it's uh, it just needs a few things finishing off to get to PC, then it might be sensible for the council, council to step in. But in that situation, the council needs to line up all the construction contracts, the warranties, the guarantees, the commissionings, and also know that the tenants uh, for, for the building at the end of the day also want to 
um, still continue to take the to take the building that's being completed. And then again, just to do a health check regarding the procurement and whether or not the council will find itself um, in breach of any of the procurement rules by sort of stepping in and placing construction contracts or indeed its own sort of standing orders. Um, but yeah, there we go. Thank you. Um, I think this question is probably for me and it is around what what changes we would anticipate to um, construction contracts as a consequence of um, COVID-19 um, um, that are relevant for the public sector. Um, I've been thinking about this actually, it came up in a, a call that we did a, a week or so ago, and uh, you will know that there is some pressure being put on government employees um, to release retention. Um, and I wonder whether um, public sector contracts um, will preclude the holding of retention monies um, against um, contractors. That's one thing that I think may well happen. Um, I think that the measures that the employer um, can introduce to ensure that it is um, having the opportunity to view completely down the supply chain so um, ensuring that payments are getting to subcontractors um, so by way of example there's an opportunity to require the main contractor to um, demonstrate that payments have been made um, to subcontractors before further payments are made to the main contractor um, I think that's something um, that we may see uh, I think there's um, going to be even more pressure than there has been recently um, for project bank accounts to be set up um, so that there is some certainty and security um, for everyone that the monies held in the project bank account are available to pay everyone involved. Um, and I, I see that as being um, uh, quite, a, a quite likely, particularly in the public sector, uh, where this has been mooted for some time. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, participating today. Um, I think that these are uh, very curious times, as, as we know. Hopefully, today's um, webinar and that which we uh, produced last week have given um, some answers to many of the questions which you will have. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there is a Field Fisher um, free help desk for authorities and details for that will be circulated um, to you. There is a survey which we're very grateful for you to, to complete and hand back to us. Um, and as many of you have asked, the slides and recording for today and the recording from um, last Friday session will be made available. So um, thank you to my fellow uh, partners, to John, Mel and Michelle, and I, I wish everyone a good afternoon. Thanks very much.